This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part Number 1. Some Commendatory Verses. Urganda the Unknown. To the Book of Don Quixote of La Mancha. If to be welcomed by the good, O book, thou make thy steady aim, No empty chatterer will dare To question or dispute thy claim. But if perchance thou hast a mind To win of idiots approbation, Lost labor will be thy reward, Though they'll pretend appreciation. They say a goodly shade he finds, Who shelters neath a goodly tree, And such a one thy kindly star In beige or bath provided thee, a royal tree whose spreading boughs a show of princely fruit display a tree that bears a noble duke the alexander of his day of a manchigan gentleman thy purpose is to tell the story relating how he lost his wits o idle tales of love and glory of ladies arms and cavaliers a new orlando furioso enamorato rather who won dulcinea del toboso Put no vain emblems on thy shield, all figures that is bragging play. A modest dedication make, and give no scoffer room to say. What Alvaro de Luna here, or is it Hannibal again? Or does King Francis at Madrid once more of destiny complain? Since heaven it hath not pleased on thee deep erudition to bestow, or black Latino's gift of tongues, no Latin let thy pages show. Ape not philosophy or wit, lest one who cannot comprehend Make a wry face at thee and ask, Why offer flowers to me, my friend? Be not a meddler, no affair, of thine the life thy neighbors led. Be prudent, oft the random jest recoils upon the jester's head. Thy constant labor let it be, to earn thyself an honest name, For fooleries preserved in print are perpetuity of shame. A further counsel bear in mind, if that thy roof be made of glass, it shows small wit to pick up stones, and pelt the people as they pass. Win the attention of the wise, and give the thinker food for thought, who so indites frivolities, will by but simpletons be sought. Amadi of Gaul to Don Quixote of La Mancha Sonnet Thou that didst imitate that life of mine, when I in lonely sadness on the great rock pena pobre sat disconsolate, in self-imposed penance there to pine. Thou whose sole beverage was the bitter brine, Of thine own tears, and who withouten plate, Of silver, copper, tin, in lowly state, Off the bare earth, and on earth's fruits didst dine, Live thou of thine eternal glory sure. So long as on the round of the fourth sphere, The bright Apollo shall his courses steer. In thy renown thou shalt remain secure, Thy country's name in story shall endure, And thy sage author stand without a peer. Don Meliani of Greece To Don Quixote of La Mancha Sonnet In slashing, hewing, cleaving, word and deed, I was the foremost knight of chivalry, Stout, bold, expert as e'er the world did see, Thousands from the oppressor's wrong I freed. Great were my feats, eternal fame their meed. In love I proved my truth and loyalty. The hugest giant was a dwarf for me. Ever to knighthood's laws gave I good heed. My mastery the fickle goddess owned. And even chance, submitting to control, Grasped by the forelock, yielded to my will. Yet, though above yon horned moon enthroned, My fortune seems to sit. Great Quixote still, envy of thy achievements fills my soul. The Lady of Oriana, to Dulcinea del Toboso Sonnet O oh, fairest Dulcinea, could it be, it were a pleasant fancy to suppose so. Could Miraflores change to El Toboso, and London's town to that which shelters thee? O oh, could mine but acquire that livery, of countless charms thy mind and body show so? Or him, now famous grown, thou madest him grow so, Thy knight in some dread combat could I see. O oh, could I be released from Amadi, By exercise of such coy chastity, 
as led thee gentle Quixote to dismiss, then would my heavy sorrow turn to joy. None would I envy, all would envy me, and happiness be mine without alloy. Gandolin, squire of Amadi of Gaul, to Sancho Panza, squire of Don Quixote. Sonnet All hail, illustrious man, fortune when she bound the apprentice to the esquire trade, her care and tenderness of thee displayed, shaping thy course from misadventure free. No longer now doth proud knight errantry regard with scorn the sickle and the spade. Of towering arrogance less count is made than of plain esquire like simplicity. I envy thee thy dapple and thy name, and those alforjas thou wast wont to stuff, with comforts that thy providence proclaim. Excellent Sancho, hail to thee again. To thee alone the Ovid of our Spain does homage with the rustic kiss and cuff. From El Donoso, the motley poet, on Sancho Panza and Rocinante. On Sancho. I am the esquire Sancho Pan, who served Don Quixote of La Man. But from his service I retreat, resolved to pass my life discreet. For Villa Diego, called La Si, maintained that only in Riti was found the secret of well be, according to the Celesti a book divine except for sin, by speech too plain, in my opin. On Rocinante I am that Rocinante fay, great-grandson of the baby, who all for being lean and bone, had one Don Quixote for an own. But if I matched him well in weak, I never took short commons meek, but kept myself in corn by steel, a trick I learned from Lazareel. When with a piece of straw so neat, the blind man of his wine he cheat. Orlando Furioso, to Don Quixote of La Mancha. Sonnet If thou art not a peer, peer thou hast none. Among a thousand peers thou art a peer, nor is there room for one when thou art near. Unvanquished victor, great unconquered one, Orlando by Angelica undone am I. Our distant seas condemned to steer, and to fame's altars as an offering bear, valor respected by oblivion. I cannot be thy rival, for thy fame and prowess rise above all rivalry, albeit both bereft of wits we go. But though the Scythian or the more to tame was not thy lot, still thou dost rival me. Love binds us in a fellowship of woe. The Knight of Phoebus to Don Quixote of La Mancha. My sword was not to be compared with thine, Phoebus of Spain, marvel of courtesy, nor with thy famous arm this hand of mine, that smote from east to west as lightnings fly. I scorned all empire and that monarchy, the rosy east held out did I resign, for one glance of Clary Diana's eye, the bright aurora for whose love I pine, a miracle of constancy, my love and banished by her ruthless cruelty. This arm had might the rage of hell to tame, but gothic Quixote, happier thou dost prove, for thou dost live in Dulcinea's name, and famous, honored, wise, she lives in thee. From Sol Sidon to Don Quixote of La Mancha Sonnet Your fantasies, Sir Quixote, it is true, that crazy brain of yours have quite upset, but aught of base or mean hath never yet been charged by any in reproach to you. Your deeds are open proof in all men's view, for you went forth in justice to abate. And for your pains, sword rubbings did you get from many a rascally and ruffian crew. If the fair Dulcinea, your heart's queen, be unrelenting in her cruelty, if still your woe be powerless to move her, in such hard case your comfort let it be that Sancho was a sorry go-between. A booby he, hard-hearted she, and you no lover. Dialogue between Babieca and Rocinante Sonnet How comes it, Rocinante, you're so lean? I'm underfed, with overwork I'm worn. But what becomes of all the hay and corn? My master gives me none, he's much too mean. Come, come, you show ill-breeding, sir, I ween. Tis like an ass your master thus to scorn. He is an ass, will die an ass, an ass was born. 
Why, he's in love, what's plainer to be seen? To be in love is folly? No, great sense. You're metaphysical. From want of food. Rail at the squire, then. Why, what's the good? I might indeed complain of him, I grant ye. But squire or master, what's the difference? They're both as sorry hacks as Rocinante. End of part number two. Some commendatory verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A. R. Dobbs, San Francisco, May 2006. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. The Author's Preface. Idle reader. Thou mayst believe me without any oath that I would this book, as it is the child of my brain, were the fairest, gayest, and cleverest that could be imagined. But I could not counteract nature's law, that everything shall beget its like, and what then could this sterile, ill-tilled wit of mine beget but the story of a dry, shriveled, whimsical offspring, full of thoughts of all sorts and such as never came into any other imagination, just what might be begotten in a prison, where every misery is lodged, and every doleful sound makes its dwelling. Tranquillity, a cheerful retreat, pleasant fields, bright skies, murmuring brooks, peace of mind, these are the things that go far to make even the most barren muses fertile, and bring into the world births that fill it with wonder and delight. Sometimes when a father has an ugly, loutish son, the love he bears him so blindfolds his eyes that he does not see his defects, or, rather, takes them for gifts and charms of mind and body, and talks of them to his friends as wit and grace. I, however, for though I pass for the father, I am but the stepfather to Don Quixote, have no desire to go with the current of custom, or to implore the dearest reader almost with tears in my eyes, as others do, to pardon or excuse the defects thou wilt perceive in this child of mine. Thou art neither its kinsman nor its friend. Thy soul is thy own, and thy will as free as any man's, whate'er he be. Thou art in thine own house, and master of it as much as the king of his taxes, and thou knowest the common saying, Under my cloak I kill the king, all which exempts and frees thee from every consideration and obligation and thou canst say what thou wilt of the story, without fear of being abused for any ill, or rewarded for any good thou mayst say of it. My wish would be simply to present it to thee, plain and unadorned, without any embellishment or preface, or uncountable muster of customary sonnets, epigrams, and eulogies, such as are commonly put at the beginnings of books. For I can tell thee, though composing it cost me some labor, I found none greater than the making of this preface thou art now reading. Many times did I take up my pen to write it, and many did I lay it down again, not knowing what to say. One of these times, as I was pondering with the paper before me, a pen in my ear, my elbow on the desk, and my cheek in my hand, thinking of what I should say, there came in, unexpectedly, a certain lively, clever friend of mine, who, seeing me so deep in thought, asked the reason, to which I, making no mystery of it, answered that I was thinking of the preface I had to make for the story of Don Quixote, which so troubled me that I had a mind not to make any at all, nor even publish the achievements of so noble a knight. For how could you expect me not to feel uneasy about what that ancient lawgiver they call the public will say when it sees me, after slumbering so many years in the silence of oblivion, coming out now with all my years upon my back, and with a book as dry as a rush, devoid of invention, meagre in style, poor in thoughts, wholly wanting in learning and wisdom, without quotations in the margin, or annotations at the end, after the fashion of other books I see, which, though all fables and profanity, are so full of maxims from Aristotle and Plato, and the whole herd of philosophers, that they fill the readers with amazement, and convince them that the authors are men of learning, erudition, and eloquence. And then, when they quote the Holy Scriptures, any one would say they are St. Thomas's or other doctors of the Church, observing as they do a decorum so 
ingenious that in one sentence they describe a distracted lover and in the next deliver a devout little sermon that it is a pleasure and a treat to hear and read of all this there will be nothing in my book for i have nothing to quote in the margin or to note at the end and still less do i know what authors i follow in it to place them at the beginning as all do under the letters a b c beginning with aristotle and ending with xenophon or zoilus or Zeusus, though one was a slanderer and the other a painter also my book must do without sonnets at the beginning at least sonnets whose authors are dukes and marquises counts bishops ladies or famous poets though if i were to ask two or three obliging friends i know they would give me them and such as the productions of those that have the highest reputation in our spain could not equal in short my friend i continued i am determined that senor don quixote shall remain buried in the archives of his own la mancha until heaven provide some one to garnish him with all those things he stands in need of because i find myself through my shallowness and want of learning, unequal to supplying them, and because I am by nature shy and careless about hunting for authors to say what I myself can say without them. Hence the cogitation and abstraction you found me in, and reason enough that you have heard from me. Hearing this, my friend, giving himself a slap on the forehead and breaking into a hearty laugh, exclaimed, before god brother now i am disabused of an error in which i had been living all this long time i have known you all through which i have taken you to be shrewd and sensible in all you do but now i see you are as far from that as the heaven is from the earth is it possible that things of so little moment and so easy to set right can occupy and perplex a ripe wit like yours fit to break through and crush far greater obstacles by my faith this comes not of any want of ability but of too much indolence and too little knowledge of life do you want to know if i am telling the truth well then attend to me and you will see how in the opening and shutting of an eye i sweep away all your difficulties and supply all those deficiencies which you say check and discourage you from bringing before the world the story of your famous don quixote the light and mirror of all night errantry say on said i listening to his talk how do you propose to make up for my diffidence and reduce to order this chaos of perplexity i am in to which he made answer your first difficulty about the sonnets epigrams or complimentary verses which you want for the beginning and which ought to be by persons of importance and rank can be removed if you yourself take a little trouble to make them you can afterwards baptize them and put any name you like to them, fathering them on Prester John of the Indies, or the Emperor of Trebizond, who, to my knowledge, were said to have been famous poets, and even if they were not, and any pedants or bachelors should attack you and question the fact, never care to Maravedis for that, for even if they prove a lie against you, they cannot cut off the hand you wrote it with. As for references in the margin to the books and authors from whom you take the aphorisms and sayings that you put into your story, it is only contriving to fit in nicely any sentences or scraps of Latin you may happen to have by heart, or at any rate that will not give you much trouble to look up, so as, when you speak of freedom and captivity, to insert, Non bene pro toto libertas venditur auro, and then, refer in the margin to horace or whoever said it or if you allude to the power of death to come in with pallida mors equo pulsat pede pauperum tabernas regum ketures if it be friendship and the love god bids us bear to our enemy go at once to the holy scriptures which you can do with a very small amount of research, and quote no less than the words of God himself. Ego autum dico vobis diligite inimicos vestros. If you speak of evil thoughts, turn to the gospel. De corde exeunt cogitationes male. If of the fickleness of friends there is Cato, who will give you his distich. Donec eris Felix multos numerabis amicos, tempora si fuerint nubila solus eris. 
with these and such like bits of Latin, they will take you for a grammarian at all events, and that nowadays is no small honor and profit. With regards to adding annotations at the end of the book, you may safely do it this way. If you mention any giant in your book, contrive that it shall be the giant Goliath, and with this alone, which will cost you almost nothing, you have a grand note, for you can put, The giant Goliath, or Goliath, was a Philistine whom the shepherd David slew by a mighty stone, cast in the Terebinth Valley, as is related in the Book of Kings, in the chapter where you find it written. Next, to prove yourself a man of erudition in polite literature and cosmography, manage that the river Tagus shall be named in your story, and there you are at once with another famous annotation, setting forth, The river Tagus was so called after a king of Spain. It has its source in such and such a place, and falls into the ocean, kissing the walls of the famous city of Lisbon, and it is a common belief that it has golden sands, etc., if you should have anything to do with robbers, I will give you the story of Cacus, for I have it by heart. If with loose women, there is the Bishop of Mondonedo, who will give you the loans of Lamia, Laida, and Flora, any reference to whom will bring you great credit. If with hard-hearted ones, Ovid will furnish you with Medea. If with witches or enchantresses, Homer has Calypso and Virgil Circe. If with valiant captains, Julius Caesar himself will lend you himself in his own commentaries, and Plutarch will give you a thousand Alexanders. If you should deal with love, with two ounces you may know of Tuscan, you can go to Leon the Hebrew, who will supply you to your heart's content. Or, if you should not care to go to foreign countries, you have at home Fonseca's Of the Love of God, in which is condensed all that you or the most imaginative mind can want on the subject. In short, all you have to do is to manage to quote these names, or refer to these stories I have mentioned, and leave it to me to insert the annotations and quotations, and I swear by all that's good to fill up your margins and use up four sheets at the end of the book. Now, let us come to those references to authors which other books have and you want for yours. The remedy for this is very simple. You have only to look out for some book that quotes them all, from A to Z, as you say yourself, and then insert the very same alphabet in your book. And though the imposition may be plain to see, because you have so little need to borrow from them, that is no matter. There will probably be some simple enough to believe that you have made use of all of them in this plain, artless story of yours. At any rate, if it answers no other purpose, this long catalogue of authors will serve to give a surprising look of authority to your book. Besides, no one will trouble himself to verify whether you have followed them or whether you have not, being no way concerned in it. Especially as, if I mistake not, this book of yours has no need of any one of those things you say at once, for it is, from beginning to end, an attack upon the books of chivalry, of which Aristotle never dreamt, nor St. Basil said a word, nor Cicero had any knowledge, nor do the niceties of truth, nor the observations of astrology come within the range of its fanciful vagaries, nor have geometrical measurements or refutations of the arguments used in rhetoric anything to do with it, nor does it mean to preach to anybody, mixing up things human and divine, a sort of motley in which no Christian understanding should dress itself. It has only to avail itself of truth to nature in its composition." and the more perfect the imitation, the better the work will be. And as this piece of yours aims at nothing more than to destroy the authority and influence which books of chivalry have in the world with the public, there is no need for you to go a-begging for aphorisms from philosophers, precepts from holy scripture, fables from poets, speeches from orators, or miracles from saints but merely to take care that your style and diction run musically, pleasantly, and plainly, with clear, proper, and well-placed words, setting forth your purpose to the best of your power, and putting your ideas intelligibly, without confusion or obscurity. Strive, too, that in reading your story the melancholy may be moved to laughter, and the merry made merrier still, that the simple shall not be wearied, that the judicious shall admire the invention, 
that the grave shall not despise it, nor the wise fail to praise it. Finally, keep your aim fixed on the destruction of that ill-founded edifice of the books of chivalry, hated by some and praised by many more. For if you succeed in this, you will have achieved no small success. In profound silence I listened to what my friend said, and his observations made such an impression on me that, without attempting to question them, I admitted their soundness, and out of them I determined to make this preface. Wherein, gentle reader, thou wilt perceive my friend's good sense, my good fortune in finding such an adviser in such a time of need, and what thou hast gained in receiving, without addition or alteration, the story of the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, who is held by all the inhabitants of the district of the Campo de Montiel to have been the chastest lover and the bravest knight that has, for many years, been seen in that neighborhood. I have no desire to magnify the service I render thee in making thee acquainted with so renowned and honored a knight, but I do desire thy thanks for the acquaintance thou wilt make with the famous Sancho Panza, his squire, in whom, to my thinking, I have given thee, condensed, all the squirely drolleries that are scattered throughout the swarm of the vain books of chivalry. And so may God give thee health, and not forget me, Vale. End of Author's Preface This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A. R. Dobbs, San Francisco, May 2006. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Dedication and Chapters 1, 2, and 3. Dedication of Volume 1. To the Duke of Bejar, Marquis of Gibralion, Count of Benalcazar and Banares, Viscount of the Puebla de Alcocer, Master of the towns of Capilla, Curiel, and Burguillos. In belief of the good reception and honours that Your Excellency bestows on all sorts of books, as prince, so inclined to favour good arts, chiefly those who by their nobleness do not submit to the service and bribery of the vulgar, I have determined bringing to light the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, in shelter of Your Excellency's glamorous name, to whom, with the obeisance I owe to such grandeur, I pray to receive it agreeably under his protection, so that in this shadow, though deprived of that pernicious ornament of elegance and erudition that clothe the works composed in the houses of those who know, it dares appear with assurance in the judgment of some who, trespassing the bounds of their own ignorance, use to condemn with more rigor and less justice the writings of others. It is my earnest hope that Your Excellency's good counsel in regard to my honorable purpose will not disdain the littleness of so humble a service. Miguel de Cervantes Volume 1, Chapter 1 Which treats of the character and pursuits of the famous gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. In a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to call to mind, there lived, not long since, one of those gentlemen that keep a lance in the lance-rack, an old buckler, a lean hack, and a greyhound for coursing, an olla of rather more beef than mutton, a salad on most nights, scraps on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, and a pigeon or so extra on Sundays, made away with three-quarters of his income. The rest of it went in a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun. He had in his house a housekeeper past forty, a niece under twenty, and a lad for the field and market-place, who used to saddle the hack as well as handle the bill-hook. The age of this gentleman of ours was bordering on fifty. He was of a hardy habit, spare, gaunt-featured, a very early riser, and a great sportsman. They will have it his surname was Quijada, or Quesada, 
for here there is some difference of opinion among the authors who write on the subject, although from reasonable conjectures it seems plain that he was called Kihana. This, however, is of but little importance to our tale. It will be enough not to stray a hair's breadth from the truth in the telling of it. You must know, then, that the above-named gentleman, whenever he was at leisure, which was mostly all the year round, gave himself up to reading books of chivalry, with such ardour and avidity that he almost entirely neglected the pursuits of his field-sports, and even the management of his property, and to such a pitch did his eagerness and infatuation go that he sold many an acre of tillage land to buy books of chivalry to read, and brought home as many of them as he could get. But of all there were none he liked so well as those of the famous Feliciano de Silva's composition, for their lucidity of style and complicated conceits were as pearls in his sight, particularly when in his reading he came upon courtships and cartels, where he often found passages like, The reason of the unreason with which my reason is afflicted so weakens my reason that with reason I murmur at your beauty. Or again, The high heavens that of your divinity divinely fortify you with the stars, render you deserving of the desert your greatness deserves. Over conceits of this sort the poor gentleman lost his wits, and used to lie awake, striving to understand them, and worm the meaning out of them. What Aristotle himself could not have made out or extracted, had he come to life again for that special purpose. He was not at all easy about the wounds which Don Belianis gave and took, because it seemed to him that, great as were the surgeons who had cured him, he must have had his face and body covered all over with seams and scars. He commended, however, the author's way of ending his book with the promise of that interminable adventure, and many a time was he tempted to take up his pen and finish it properly, as is there proposed, which no doubt he would have done, and made a successful piece of work of it too, had not greater and more absorbing thoughts prevented him. Many an argument did he have with the curate of his village, a learned man, and a graduate of Siguenza, as to which had been the better knight, Palmerin of England, or Amadis of Gaul. Master Nicholas, the village barber, however, used to say that neither of them came up to the knight of Phoebus, and that if there was any that could compare with him, it was Don Galior, the brother of Amadis of Gaul, because he had a spirit that was equal to every occasion, and was no finikin knight, nor lachrymose like his brother, while in the matter of valour he was not a whit behind him. In short, he became so absorbed in his books, that he spent his nights from sunset to sunrise, and his days from dawn to dark, poring over them. And what with little sleep and much reading, his brains got so dry that he lost his wits. His fancy grew full of what he used to read about in his books, enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, loves, agonies, and all sorts of impossible nonsense, and it so possessed his mind that the whole fabric of invention and fancy he read of was true, that to him no history in the world had more reality in it. He used to say, the Cid of Roy Diaz was a very good knight, but that he was not to be compared with the knight of the burning sword, who with one backstroke cut in half two fierce and monstrous giants. He thought more of Bernardo del Carpio, because at Roncesvalles he slew Roland in spite of enchantments, availing himself of the artifice of Hercules when he strangled Anteus, the son of Terra, in his arms. He approved highly of the giant Morgante, because although of the giant breed, which is always arrogant and ill-conditioned, he alone was affable and well-bred. But, above all, he admired Reynaldos of Montalban, especially when he saw him sallying forth from his castle and robbing every one he met, and when beyond the seas he stole that image of Mahomet, which, as his history says, was entirely of gold to have a bout of kicking at that traitor of a genelon, he would have given his housekeeper and his niece into the bargain. In short, 
His wits being quite gone, he hit upon the strangest notion that ever madman in this world hit upon, and that was that he fancied it was right and requisite, as well for the support of his own honour as for the service of his country, that he should make a knight-errant of himself, roaming the world over in full armour and on horseback in quest of adventures, and putting in practice himself all that he had read of as being the usual practices of knights-errant writing every kind of wrong, and exposing himself to peril and danger, from which, in the issue, he was to reap eternal renown and fame. Already the poor man saw himself crowned by the might of his arm, Emperor of Trebizond, at least. And so, led away by the intense enjoyment he found in these pleasant fancies, he set himself forthwith to put his scheme into execution. The first thing he did was to clean up some armour that had belonged to his great-grandfather, and had been for ages lying forgotten in a corner, eaten with rust and covered with mildew. He scoured and polished it as best he could, but he perceived one great deficit in it, that it had no closed helmet, nothing but a simple morion. This deficiency, however, his ingenuity supplied, for he contrived a kind of half-helmet of pasteboard, which, fitted on to the morion, looked like a whole one. It is true that, in order to see if it was strong and fit to stand a cut, he drew his sword and gave it a couple of slashes, the first of which undid in an instant what had taken him a week to do. The ease with which he had knocked it to pieces disconcerted him somewhat, and to guard against that danger he set to work again fixing bars of iron on the inside until he was satisfied with its strength, and then, not caring to try any more experiments with it, he passed it and adopted it as a helmet of the most perfect construction. He next proceeded to inspect his hack, which, with more quartos than a real, and more blemishes than the steed of Jonela, that tantum pelus et ossa fuit, surpassed in his eyes the Bucephalus of Alexander or the Babieca of the Cid. Four days were spent in thinking what name to give him, because, as he said to himself, it was not right that a horse belonging to a knight so famous and one with such merits of his own should be without some distinctive name, and he strove to adapt it so as to indicate what he had been before belonging to a knight-errant and what he then was, for it was only reasonable that, his master taking a new character, he should take a new name, and that it should be a distinguished and full-sounding one, befitting the new order and calling he was about to follow. And so, after having composed, struck out, rejected, added to, unmade and remade, a multitude of names out of his memory and fancy, he decided upon calling him Rosanante, a name to his thinking lofty, sonorous, and significant of his condition as a hack before he became what he now was, the first and foremost of all the hacks in the world. Having got a name for his horse so much to his taste, he was anxious to get one for himself, and he was eight days more pondering over this point, till at last he made up his mind to call himself Don Quixote. Whence, as has been already said, the authors of this veracious history have inferred that his name must have been beyond a doubt Quijada, and not Quesada, as others would have it. Recollecting, however, that the valiant Amadis was not content to call himself curtly Amadis, and nothing more, but added the name of his kingdom and country to make it famous, and called himself Amadis of Gaul, he, like a good knight, resolved to add on the name of his, and to style himself Don Quixote of La Mancha, whereby, he considered, he described accurately his origin and country, and did honour to it in taking his surname from it. So then, his armour being furbished, his morion turned into a helmet, his hack christened, and he himself confirmed he came to the conclusion that nothing more was needed now but to look out for a lady to be in love with. For a knight-errant without love is like a tree without leaves or fruit, or a body without a soul. As he said to himself, If for my sins, or by my good fortune, 
I come across some giant hereabouts, a common occurrence with knights errant, and overthrow him in one onslaught, or cleave him asunder to the waist, or, in short, vanquish and subdue him. Will it not be well to have some one I may send him to as a present, that he may come in and fall on his knees before my sweet lady, and in a humble, submissive voice say, I am the giant Caraculiambro, lord of the island of Malindrania, vanquished in single combat by the never-sufficiently extolled knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, who has commanded me to present myself before your grace, that your highness dispose of me at your pleasure. Oh, how our good gentleman enjoyed the delivery of this speech, especially when he had thought of someone to call his lady. There was, so the story goes, in a village near his own, a very good-looking farm girl, with whom he had been at one time in love though, as far as is known, she never knew it, nor gave a thought to the matter. Her name was Aldonza Lorenzo, and upon her he thought fit to confer the title of Lady of His Thoughts, and after some search for a name which should not be out of harmony with her own, and should suggest and indicate that of a princess and great lady, he decided upon calling her Dulcinea del Toboso, she being of El Toboso, a name to his mind musical, uncommon, and significant, like all those he had already bestowed upon himself and the things belonging to him. CHAPTER Two, WHICH TREATS OF THE FIRST SALLY THE INGENIOUS DON QUIXOTE MADE FROM HOME. These preliminaries settled, he did not care to put off any longer the execution of his design, urged on to it by the thought of all the world was losing by his delay, seeing what wrongs he intended to right, grievances to redress, injustices to repair, abuses to remove, and duties to discharge. So, without giving notice of his intention to any one, and without anybody seeing him, one morning before the dawning of the day, which was one of the hottest of the month of July, he donned his suit of armor, mounted Rocinante, with his patched-up helmet on, braced his buckler, took his lance, and by the back door of the yard sallied forth upon the plain in the highest contentment and satisfaction at seeing with what ease he had made a beginning of his grand purpose. But scarcely did he find himself upon the open plain, when a terrible thought struck him, one all but enough to make him abandon the enterprise at the very outset. It occurred to him that he had not been dubbed a knight, and that, according to the law of chivalry, he neither could nor ought to bear arms against any knight, and that, even if he had been, still he ought, as a novice knight, to wear white armor, without a device upon the shield, until by his prowess he had earned one. These reflections made him waver in his purpose, but his craze being stronger than any reasoning, he made up his mind to have himself dubbed a knight by the first one he came across following the example of others in the same case, as he had read in the books that brought him to this pass. As for white armor, he resolved on the first opportunity to scour his until it was whiter than an ermine. And so comforting himself, he pursued his way, taking that which his horse chose. For in this, he believed, lay the essence of adventures. Thus setting out, our new-fledged adventurer paced along, talking to himself, and saying, Who knows, but that in time to come, when the voracious history of my famous deeds is made known, the sage who writes it, when he has to set forth my first sally in the early morning, will do it after this fashion. Scarce had the rubicund Apollo spread o'er the face of the broad spacious earth the golden threads of his bright hair. Scarce had the little birds of painted plumage attuned their notes to hail with dulcet and mellifluous harmony the coming of the rosy dawn, 
that, deserting the soft couch of her jealous spouse, was appearing to mortals at the gates and balconies of the Manchugan horizon. When the renowned knight, Don Quixote of La Mancha, quitting the lazy down, mounted his celebrated steed Rocinante, and began to traverse the ancient and famous Campo de Montiel, which, in fact, he was actually traversing. Happy the age, happy the time, he continued, in which shall be made known my deeds of fame, worthy to be moulded in brass, carved in marble, limed in pictures for a memorial for ever. And thou, O sage magician, whoever thou art, to whom it shall fall to be the chronicler of this wondrous history, forget not, I entreat thee, my good Rocinante, the constant companion of my ways and wanderings. Presently he broke out again as if he were love-stricken in earnest. Oh, Princess Dulcinea, lady of this captive heart, a grievous wrong hast thou done me to drive me forth with scorn and with inexorable obduracy banish me from the presence of thy beauty. O oh, lady, deign to hold in remembrance this heart, thy vassal, that thus in anguish pines for love of thee. So he went on, stringing together these and other absurdities, all in the style of those his books had taught him, imitating their language as well as he could, and all the while... He rode so slowly, and the sun mounted so rapidly and with such fervor, that it was enough to melt his brains, if he had any. Nearly all day he traveled without anything remarkable happening to him, at which he was in despair, for he was anxious to encounter some one at once upon whom to try the might of his strong arm. Writers there are who say the first adventure he met with was that of Puerta la Pisa. Others say it was that of the windmills, but what I have ascertained on this point, and what I have found written in the annals of La Mancha, is that he was on the road all day, and towards nightfall his hack and he found themselves dead tired and hungry, when, looking all around to see if he could discover any castle or shepherd's shanty, where he might refresh himself and relieve his sore once, he perceived not far out of his road an inn, which was as welcome as a star guiding him to the portals, if not the palaces, of his redemption, and quickening his pace he reached it just as night was setting in. At the door were standing two young women, girls of the district as they call them, on their way to Seville, with some carriers who had chanced to halt that night at the inn. And as, happened what might to our adventurer, everything he saw or imagined seemed to him to be and to happen after the fashion of what he read of, the moment he saw the inn, he pictured it to himself as a castle, with its four turrets and pinnacles of shining silver, not forgetting the drawbridge and moat, and all the belongings usually ascribed to castles of the sort. To this inn, which to him seemed a castle, he advanced, and at a short distance from it he checked Rocinante, hoping that some dwarf would show himself upon the battlements, and by sound of trumpet give notice that a knight was approaching the castle. But seeing that they were slow about it, and that Rocinante was in a hurry to reach the stable, he made for the inn door, and perceived the two gay damsels who were standing there, and who seemed to him to be two fair maidens, or lovely ladies, taking their ease, at the castle gate. At this moment it so happened that a swineherd who was going through the stubbles, collecting a drove of pigs, for without any apology that is what they are called, gave a blast of his horn to bring them together, and forthwith it seemed to Don Quixote to be what he was expecting, the signal of some dwarf announcing his arrival. And so, 
with prodigious satisfaction, he rode up to the inn and to the ladies, who, seeing a man of this sort, approaching in full armor and with lance and buckler, were turning in dismay into the inn, when Don Quixote, guessing their fear by their flight, raising his pasteboard visor, disclosed his dry, dusty visage, and with courteous bearing and gentle voice addressed them. "'Your ladyships need not fly or fear any rudeness, for that it belongs not to the order of knighthood which I profess to offer to any one, much less to high-born maidens, as your appearance proclaims you to be.' The girls were looking at him, and straining their eyes to make out the features which the clumsy visor obscured, but when they heard themselves called maidens, a thing so much out of their line, they could not restrain their laughter, which made Don Quixote wax indignant, and say, "'Modesty becomes the fair, and moreover laughter that has little cause is great silliness. This, however, I say not to pain or anger you, for my desire is none other than to serve you.' The incomprehensible language and the unpromising looks of our cavalier only increased the lady's laughter, and that increased his irritation, and matters might have gone farther if, at that moment, the landlord had not come out, who, being a very fat man, was a very peaceful one. He, seeing this grotesque figure clad in armor that did not match any more than his saddle, bridle, lance, buckler, or corselet, was not at all indisposed to join the damsels in their manifestations of amusement, but, in truth, standing in awe of such a complicated armament, he thought it best to speak him fairly, so he said, "'Signor Caballero, if your worship wants lodging, baiting the bed, for there is not one in the inn, there is plenty of everything else here.' Don Quixote, observing the respectful bearing of the Alcaide of the fortress, for so the innkeeper and inn seemed in his eyes, made answer, "'Sir Castellon, for me, anything will suffice, for my armour is my only wear, my only rest the fray.' The host fancied he called him Castellon, because he took him for a worthy of Castile, though he was in fact an Andalusian and one from the strand of San Lucar, as crafty a thief as Cacus, and as full of tricks as a student or a page. "'In that case,' he said, "'your bed is on the flinty rock, your sleep to watch alway. And if so, you may dismount, and safely reckon upon any quantity of sleeplessness under this roof for a twelve-month, not to say for a single night.' So saying, he advanced to hold the stirrup for Don Quixote who got down with great difficulty and exertion, for he had not broken his fast all day, and then charged the host to take great care of his horse, as he was the best bit of flesh that ever ate bread in this world. The landlord eyed him over, but did not find him as good as Don Quixote said, nor even half as good, and putting him up in the stable, he returned to see what might be wanted by his guest, whom the damsels, who had by this time made their peace with him, were now relieving of his armour. They had taken off his breastplate and back-piece, but they neither knew nor saw how to open his gorget, or remove his makeshift helmet, for he had fastened it with green ribbons, which, as there was no untying the knots, required to be cut. This, however, he would not by any means consent to, so he remained all the evening with his helmet on, the drollest and oddest figure that can be imagined, and while they were removing his armour, taking the baggages who were about it for ladies of high degree belonging to the castle, he said to them, with great sprightliness, "'Oh, never surely was there knight so served by hand of dame, as served was he Don Quixote height, when from his town he came, with maidens waiting on himself, princesses on his hack, or Rocinante, for that, lady's mine, is my horse's name, and Don Quixote of La Mancha is my own. For though I had no intention of declaring myself until my achievements in your service and honour had made me known, the necessity of adapting that old ballad of Lancelot to the present occasion has given you the knowledge of my name altogether prematurely. A time, however, will come 
for your ladyships to command and me to obey, and then the might of my arm will show my desire to serve you. The girls, who were not used to hearing rhetoric of this sort, had nothing to say in reply. They only asked him if he wanted anything to eat. I would gladly eat a bit of something, said Don Quixote, for I feel it would come very seasonably. The day happened to be a Friday, and in the whole inn there was nothing but some pieces of the fish they call in Castile abedejo, in Andalusia bacallao, and in some places curadillo, and in others troutlet. So they asked him if he thought he could eat troutlet, for there was no other fish to give him. If there be troutlets enough, said Don Quixote, they will be the same thing as a trout, for it is all one to me whether I am given eight reals in small change or a piece of eight. Moreover, it may be that these troutlets are like veal, which is better than beef, or kid, which is better than goat. But whatever it be, let it come quickly, for the burden and pressure of arms cannot be borne without support to the inside. They laid a table for him at the door of the inn for the sake of the air, and the host brought him a portion of ill-soaked and worse-cooked stockfish, and a piece of bread as black and mouldy as his own armour. But a laughable sight it was to see him eating, for having his helmet on and the beaver up, he could not with his own hands put anything into his mouth unless some one else placed it there, and this service one of the ladies rendered him. But to give him anything to drink was impossible, or would have been so had not the landlord bored a reed, and putting one end in his mouth poured the wine into him through the other, all which he bore with patience rather than sever the ribbons of his helmet. While this was going on there came up to the inn a sow-gelder, who, as he approached, sounded his reed pipe four or five times, and thereby completely convinced Don Quixote that he was in some famous castle, and that they were regaling him with music, and that the stockfish was trout, the bread the whitest, the wenches ladies, and the landlord the castellon of the castle, and consequently he held that his enterprise and Sally had been to some purpose. But still it distressed him to think he had not been dubbed a knight, for it was plain to him that he could not lawfully engage in any adventure without receiving the order of knighthood. CHAPTER Three, WHEREIN IS RELATED THE DROLL WAY IN WHICH DON QUIXOTE HAD HIMSELF DUBBED A KNIGHT. Harassed by this reflection, he made haste with his scanty pot-house supper, and having finished it, called the landlord, and shutting himself into the stable with him, fell on his knees before him, saying, from this spot I rise not, valiant knight, until your courtesy grants me the boon I seek, one that will redound to your praise and the benefit of the human race. The landlord, seeing his guest at his feet, and hearing a speech of this kind, stood staring at him in bewilderment, not knowing what to do or say, and entreating him to rise, but all to no purpose until he had agreed to grant the boon demanded of him. I looked for no less, my lord, from your high magnificence, replied Don Quixote, and I have to tell you that the boon I have asked and your liberality has granted is that you shall dub me knight to-morrow morning, and that to-night I shall watch my arms in the chapel of this your castle. Thus to-morrow, as I have said, will be accomplished what I so much desire, enabling me lawfully to roam through all the four quarters of the world, seeking adventures on behalf of those in distress, as is the duty of chivalry and of knights-errant like myself, whose ambition is directed to such deeds. The landlord, who, as has been mentioned, was something of a wag, and had already some suspicion of his guest's want of wits, was quite convinced of it on hearing talk of this kind from him, and to make sport for the night he determined to fall in with his humour. So he told him he was quite right in pursuing the object he had in view, and that such a motive was natural and becoming in cavaliers as distinguished as he seemed and his gallant bearing showed him to be, 
and that he himself in his younger days had followed the same honorable calling. Roaming in quest of adventures in various parts of the world, among others the curing grounds of Malaga, the isles of Riaran, the precinct of Seville, the little market of Segovia, the Oliveira of Valencia, and the Rondilla of Granada, the strand of San Lucar, the cult of Cordova, the taverns of Toledo, and divers other quarters, where he had proved the nimbleness of his feet and the lightness of his fingers, doing many wrongs, cheating many widows, ruining maids, and swindling minors, and, in short, bringing himself under the notice of almost every tribunal and court of justice in Spain, until at last he had retired to this castle of his, where he was living upon his property and that of others, and where he received all knights errant of whatever rank or condition they might be, all for the great love he bore them, and that they might share their substance with him. He told him, moreover, that in this castle of his there was no chapel in which he could watch his armor, as it had been pulled down in order to be rebuilt, and that in a case of necessity it might, he knew, be watched anywhere, and he might watch it that night in a courtyard of the castle, and in the morning God willing, the requisite ceremonies might be performed so as to have him dubbed a knight, and so thoroughly dubbed that nobody could be more so. He asked if he had any money with him, to which Don Quixote replied that he had not a farthing, as in the histories of knights errant he had never read of any of them carrying any. On this point the landlord told him he was mistaken. For, though not recorded in the histories, because in the author's opinion there was no need to mention anything so obvious and necessary as money and clean shirts, it was not to be supposed, therefore, that they did not carry them, and he might regard it as certain and established that all knights errant, about whom there were so many full and unimpeachable books, carried well-furnished purses in case of emergency, and likewise carried shirts and a little box of ointment to cure the wounds they received. For in those plains and deserts where they engaged in combat and came out wounded, it was not always that there was someone to cure them, unless indeed they had for a friend some sage magician to succor them at once, by fetching through the air upon a cloud some damsel or dwarf with a vial of water of such virtue that by tasting one drop of it they were cured of their hurts and wounds in an instant, and left a sound as if they had not received any damage, whatever. But in case this should not occur, the knights of old took care to see that their squires were provided with money and other requisites, such as lint and ointments for healing purposes and when it happened that knights had no squires which was rarely and seldom the case they themselves carried everything in cunning saddle-bags that were hardly to be seen on the horse's croup as if it were something else of more importance because unless for some such reason carrying saddle-bags was not very favorably regarded among knights errant he therefore advised him and as his godson, so soon to be, he might even command him, never from that time forth to travel without money and the usual requirements, and he would find the advantage of them when he least expected it. Don Quixote promised to follow his advice scrupulously, and it was arranged forthwith that he should watch his armor in a large yard at one side of the inn. So, collecting it all together, Don Quixote placed it on a trough that stood by the side of a well, and, bracing his buckler on his arm, he grasped his lance, and began, with a stately air, to march up and down in front of the trough. And as he began his march, night began to fall. The landlord told all the people who were in the inn about the craze of his guest the watching of the armor, and the dubbing ceremony he contemplated. Full of wonder at so strange a form of madness, they flocked to see it from a distance, and observed with what composure he sometimes paced up and down, or sometimes, leaning on his lance, gazed on his armor without taking his eyes off it for ever so long. And as the night closed in, with a light from the moon so brilliant that it might vie with his that lent it, Everything the novice knight did was plainly seen by all. 
Meanwhile, one of the carriers who were in the inn thought fit to water his team, and it was necessary to remove Don Quixote's armor, as it lay on the trough. But he, seeing the other approach, hailed him in a loud voice, O thou, whoever thou art, rash knight that comest to lay hands on the armor of the most valorous errant that ever girt on sword, have a care what thou dost, touch it not unless thou wouldst lay down thy life as the penalty of thy rashness. The carrier gave no heed to these words, and he would have done better to heed them if he had been heedful of his health, but, seizing it by the straps, flung the armor some distance from him. Seeing this, Don Quixote raised his eyes to heaven, and fixing his thoughts, apparently, upon his lady Dulcinea, exclaimed, "'Aid me, lady mine, in this the first encounter that presents itself to this breast which thou holdest in subjection. Let not thy favour and protection fail me in this first jeopardy. And with these words, and others to the same purpose, dropping his buckler, he lifted his lance with both hands, and with it smote such a blow on the carrier's head that he stretched him on the ground, so stunned that had he followed it up with a second, there would have been no need of a surgeon to cure him. This done, he picked up his armor and returned to his beat with the same serenity as before. Shortly after this, another, not knowing what had happened, for the carrier still lay senseless, came with the same object of giving water to his mules, and was proceeding to remove the armor in order to clear the trough, when Don Quixote, without uttering a word or imploring aid from any one, once more dropped his buckler, and once more lifted his lance, and without actually breaking the second carrier's head into pieces, made more than three of it, for he laid it open in four. At the noise all the people of the inn ran to the spot, and among them the landlord. Seeing this, Don Quixote braced his buckler on his arm, and with his hand on his sword exclaimed, O oh, lady of beauty, strength, and support of my faint heart! It is time for thee to turn the eyes of thy greatness on this thy captive knight on the brink of so mighty an adventure. By this he felt himself so inspired that he would not have flinched if all the carriers in the world had assailed him. The comrades of the wounded, perceiving the plight they were in, began from a distance to shower stones on Don Quixote, who screened himself as best he could with his buckler, not daring to quit the trough and leave his armor unprotected. The landlord shouted to them to leave him alone, for he had already told them he was mad, and as a madman he would not be accountable, even if he killed them all. Still louder shouted Don Quixote, calling them knaves and traitors, and the lord of the castle, who allowed knights errant to be treated in this fashion, a villain and a low-born knight, whom, had he received the order of knighthood, he would call to account for his treachery. But of you, he cried, base and vile rabble, I make no account. Fling, strike, come on, do all ye can against me, ye shall see what the reward of your folly and insolence will be. This he uttered with so much spirit and boldness that he filled his assailants with a terrible fear, and as much for this reason as at the persuasion of the landlord they left off stoning him, and he allowed them to carry off the wounded, and with the same calmness and composure as before resumed the watch over his armor. But these freaks of his guest were not much to the liking of the landlord, so he determined to cut matters short, and confer upon him at once the unlucky order of knighthood before any further misadventure could occur. So going up to him, he apologized for the rudeness which, without his knowledge, had been offered to him by these low people, who, however, had been well punished for their audacity. As he had already told him, he said, there was no chapel in the castle, nor was it needed for what remained to be done, for, as he understood the ceremonial of the order, the whole point of being dubbed a knight lay in the accolade and in the slap on the shoulder, and that could be administered in the middle of a field. 
and that he had now done all that was needful as to watching the armor, for all requirements were satisfied by a watch of two hours only, while he had been more than four about it. Don Quixote believed it all, and told him he stood there ready to obey him, and to make an end of it with as much despatch as possible. For if he were again attacked, and felt himself to be dubbed a knight, he would not, he thought, leave a soul alive in the castle, except such as out of respect he might spare at his bidding. Thus warned and menaced, the Castillon forthwith brought out a book in which he used to enter the straw and barley he served out to the carriers, and, with a lad carrying a candle-end, and the two damsels already mentioned, he turned to where Don Quixote stood, and bade him kneel down. Then, reading from his account-book, as if he were repeating some devout prayer, in the middle of his delivery he raised his hand and gave him a sturdy blow on the neck, and then, with his own sword, a smart slap on the shoulder, all the while muttering between his teeth as if he was saying his prayers. Having done this, he directed one of the ladies to gird on his sword, which she did with great self-possession and gravity, and not a little was required to prevent a burst of laughter at each stage of the ceremony. But what they had already seen of the novice knight's prowess kept their laughter within bounds. In girding him with the sword, the worthy lady said to him, May God make your worship a very fortunate knight, and grant you success in battle. Don Quixote asked her her name, in order that he might from that time forward know to whom he was beholden for the favor he had received, as he meant to confer upon her some portion of the honor he acquired by the might of his arm. She answered with great humility that she was called La Talosa, and that she was the daughter of a cobbler of Toledo, who lived in the stalls of Sancho Biennaya and that wherever she might be she would serve and esteem him as her lord. Don Quixote said in reply that she would do him a favor if thenceforward she assumed the Don, and called herself Dona Talosa. She promised she would, and then the other buckled on his spur, and with her followed almost the same conversation as with the Lady of the Sword. He asked her name, and she said it was La Molinera and that she was the daughter of a respectable miller of Antequera. And of her likewise, Don Quixote requested that she would adopt the Don, and call herself Dona Molinera, making offers to her further services and favors. Having thus, with hot haste and speed, brought to a conclusion these never-till-now-seen ceremonies, Don Quixote was on thorns until he saw himself on horseback sallying forth in quest of adventures, and saddling Rocinante at once, he mounted, and, embracing his host, as he returned thanks for his kindness in knighting him, he addressed him in language so extraordinary that it is impossible to convey an idea of it or report it. The landlord, to get him out of the inn, replied with no less rhetoric, though with shorter words, and, without calling upon him to pay the reckoning, let him go with a godspeed. End of chapter 3, volume 1Translated by John Ormsby. Part two, chapters four through five. Chapter four, of what happened to our knight when he left the inn. Day was dawning when Don Quixote quitted the inn, so happy, so gay, so exhilarated at finding himself now dubbed a knight, that his joy was like to burst his horse girths. However, recalling the advice of his hosts as to the requisites he ought to carry with him especially that referring to money and shirts, he determined to go home and provide himself with all, and also with a squire, for he reckoned upon securing a farm labourer, a neighbour of his, a poor man with a family, but very well qualified for the office of squire to a knight. With this object he turned his horse's head toward the village, and Rosinant, thus reminded of his old quarters, stepped out so briskly that he hardly seemed to tread the earth. He had not gone far, when out of a thicket on his right there seemed to come feeble cries as of some one in distress, 
and the instant he heard them, he exclaimed, "'Thanks be to heaven for the favour it accords me, that it so soon offers me an opportunity of fulfilling the obligation I have undertaken, and gathering the fruit of my ambition. These cries, no doubt, come from some man or woman in want of help, and needing my aid and protection.' and wheeling he turned Rosinant in the direction where the cries seemed to proceed. He had gone but a few paces into the wood when he saw a mare tied to an oak, and tied to another, and stripped from the waist upwards a youth of about fifteen years of age, from whom the cries came. Nor were they without cause, for a lusty farmer was flogging him with a belt and following up every blow with scoldings and commands, repeating, "'Your mouth shut and your eyes open!' while the youth made answer, I won't do it again, master mine. By God's passion, I won't do it again, and I'll take more care of the flock another time. Seeing what was going on, Don Quixote said in an angry voice, Discourteous knight, it ill becomes you to assail one who cannot defend himself. Mount your steed and take your lance. For there was a lance leaning against the oak to which the mare was tied. And I will make you know that you are behaving as a coward. The farmer, seeing before him this figure in full armor, brandishing a lance over his head, gave himself up for dead, and made answer meekly, "'Sir Knight, this youth that I am chastising is my servant, employed by me to watch a flock of sheep that I have hard by, and he is so careless that I lose one every day, and when I punish him for his carelessness and knavery, he says I do it out of niggardliness, to escape paying him the wages I owe him, and before God and on my soul he lies.' "'Lies before me, base clown,' said Don Quixote. "'By the sun that shines on us, I have a mind to run you through with this lance. "'Pay him at once without another word. "'If not, by the God that rules us, I will make an end of you and annihilate you on the spot. "'Release him instantly.' "'The farmer hung his head, and without a word untied his servant, "'of whom Don Quixote asked how much his master owed him. "'He replied, nine months at seven reels a month.' Don Quixote added it up, found that it came to sixty-three reels, and told the farmer to pay it down immediately, if he did not want to die for it. The trembling cloud replied that as he lived, and by the oath he had sworn, though he had not sworn any, it was not so much, for there were to be taken into account and deducted three pairs of shoes he had given him, and a reel for two bloodlettings when he was sick. "'All that is very well,' said Don Quixote. But let the shoes and the bloodlettings stand as a set-off against the blows you have given him without any cause. For if he spoiled the leather of the shoes you paid for, you have damaged that of his body, and if the barber took blood from him when he was sick, you have drawn it when he was sound. So on that score he owes you nothing. The difficulty is, sir knight, that I have no money here. Let Andres come home with me, and I will pay him all, reel by reel. I go with him, said the youth. Nay, God forbid! "'No, senor, not for the world, for once alone with me he would ray me like a Saint Bartholomew.' "'He will do nothing of the kind,' said Don Quixote. "'I have only to command, and he will obey me. "'And as he has sworn to me by the order of knighthood which he has received, "'I leave him free, and I guarantee the payment.' "'Consider what you are saying, senor,' said the youth. "'This master of mine is not a knight, nor has he received any order of knighthood, "'for he is Juan Haldudo, the rich, of Quintanar.' "'That matters little,' replied Don Quixote. "'There may be Haldudo's knights. "'Moreover, every one is the son of his works.' "'That is true,' said Andres. "'But this master of mine, of what works is he the son, "'when he refuses me the wages of my sweat and labor? "'I do not refuse, brother Andres,' said the farmer. "'Be good enough to come along with me, "'and I swear by all the orders of knighthood there are in the world "'to pay you as I have agreed, real by real and perfumed.' "'For the perfumery I excuse you,' said Don Quixote, "'but give it to him in reels, and I shall be satisfied, "'and see that you do as you have sworn. "'If not, by the same oath I swear to come back "'and hunt you out and punish you. "'And I shall find you, though you should lie closer than a lizard. "'And if you desire to know who it is lays this command upon you, "'that you be more firmly bound to obey it, "'know that I am the valorous Don Quixote of La Mancha.' the undoer of wrongs and injustices, and so God be with you, and keep in mind what you have promised and sworn under those penalties that have already been declared to you. So saying, he gave Rosinant the spur, and was soon out of reach. The farmer followed him with his eyes, and when he saw that he had cleared the wood and was no longer in sight, 
He turned to his boy Andres and said, "'Come here, my son. I want to pay you what I owe you, as that undoer of wrongs has commanded me.' "'My oath on it,' said Andres, "'your worship will be well advised to obey the command of that good knight. May he live a thousand years, for, as he is a valiant and just judge by rock, if you do not pay me, he will come back and do as he said.' "'My oath on it, too,' said the farmer, "'but as I have a strong affection for you, "'I want to add to the debt in order to add to the payment.' "'And seizing him by the arm, he tied him up again, "'and gave him such a flogging that he left him for dead. "'Now, Master Andres,' said the farmer, "'call on the undoer of wrongs. "'You will find he won't undo that, "'though I am not sure that I have quite done with you, for I have a good mind to flay you alive. But at last he untied him, and gave him leave to look for his judge in order to put the sentence pronounced into execution. Andres went off rather down in the mouth, swearing he would go look for the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha, and tell him exactly what had happened, and that all would have to be repaid him sevenfold. But for all that he went off weeping while his master stood laughing. Thus did the valiant Don Quixote right that wrong and thoroughly satisfied with what had taken place, as he considered he had made a very happy and noble beginning with this knighthood, he took the road towards his village in perfect self-content, saying in a low voice, "'Well mayest thou this day call thyself fortunate above all on earth, O Dulcinea del Toboso, fairest of the fair, since it has fallen to thy lot to hold subject and submissive to thy full will and pleasure, a knight so renowned as is and will be Don Quixote of La Mancha, who, as all the world knows, yesterday received the order of knighthood, and hath to-day righted the greatest wrong and grievance that ever injustice conceived and cruelty perpetrated, who hath to-day plucked the rod from the hand of yonder ruthless oppressor, so wantonly lashing that tender child. He now came to a road branching in four directions, and immediately he was reminded of those crossroads where knight errants used to stop to consider which road they should take. In imitation of them he halted for a while, and, after having deeply considered it, he gave Rosinant his head, submitting his own will to that of his hack, who followed out his first intention, which was to make straight for his own stable. After he had gone about two miles, Don Quixote perceived a large party of people who, as afterwards appeared, were some Toledo traders, on their way to buy silk at Murcia. There were six of them coming along under their sunshades, with four servants mounted and three muleteers on foot. Scarcely had Don Quixote described them when the fancy possessed him that this must be some new adventure, and to help him to imitate as far as he could those passages he had read in his books, here seemed to come one made on purpose, which he resolved to attempt. So, with a lofty bearing and determination, he fixed himself firmly in his stirrups, got his lance ready, brought his buckler before his breast, and, planting himself in the middle of the road, stood waiting the approach of these knight errants, for such he now considered and held them to be. And when they had come near enough to see and hear, he exclaimed with a haughty gesture, "'All the world stand, unless all the world confess, that in all the world there is no maiden fairer than the Empress of La Mancha, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso.' The traders halted at the sound of his language and the sight of the strange figure that uttered it, and from both figure and language at once guessed the craze of their owner. They wished, however, to learn quietly what was the object of this confession that was demanded of them, and one of them, who was rather fond of a joke, and was very sharp-witted, said to him, "'Sir Knight, we do not know who this good lady is that you speak of, show her to us for if she be of such beauty as you suggest with all our hearts and without any pressure we will confess the truth that is on your part required of us if i were to show her to you replied don quixote what merit would you have in confessing a truth so manifest the essential point is that without seeing her you must believe confess affirm swear and defend it else ye have to do with me in battle ill-conditioned arrogant rabble that ye are, and come ye on, one by one, as the order of knighthood requires, or all together, as is the custom and vile usage of your breed. Here do I bide, and await your relying on the justice of the cause I maintain. Sir Knight, replied the traitor, 
I entreat your worship, in the name of this present company of princes, that to save us from charging our consciences with the confession of a thing we have neither seen nor heard of, and one moreover so much to the prejudice of the empresses and queens of the Alcarian Estremadura, your worship will be pleased to show us some portrait of this lady, though it be no bigger than a grain of wheat, for by the thread one gets at the ball, and in this way we shall be satisfied and easy, and you will be content and pleased. Nay, I believe we are already so far agreed with you that even though her portrait should show her blind of one eye and distilling vermilion and sulphur from the other, we would nevertheless, to gratify your worship, say all in her favour that you desire. She distills nothing of the kind, vile rabble, said Don Quixote, burning with rage. Nothing of the kind. I say only amergies and civet and cotton. Nor is she one-eyed or humpbacked, but straighter than a Godarama spindle. But ye must pay for the blasphemy ye have uttered against beauty like that of my lady. And so saying, he charged with levelled lance against the one who had spoken, with such fury and fierceness that, if luck had not contrived that Roncinant should stumble midway and come down, it would have gone hard with the rash traitor. Down went Rosinant, and over went his master, rolling along the ground for some distance, and when he tried to rise he was unable, so encumbered was he with lance, buckler, spurs, helmets, and the weight of his old armor, and all the while he was struggling to get up. He kept saying, Fly not, cowards and caitiffs, stay, for not by my fault, but my horses am I stretched here. One of the muleteers in attendance, who could not have had much good nature in him, hearing the poor prostrated man blustering in this style, was unable to refrain from giving him an answer on his ribs, and coming up to him he seized his lance, and having broken it in pieces, with one of them he began so to belabor our Don Quixote that, notwithstanding, and in spite of his armor, he milled him like a measure of wheat. His masters called out not to lay on so hard, and to leave him alone, but the muleteer's blood was up, and he did not care to drop the game until he had vented the rest of his wrath, and gathering up the remaining fragments of the lands, he finished with a discharge upon the unhappy victim, who all through the storm of sticks that rained on him never ceased threatening heaven and earth, and the brigands, for such they seemed to him. At last the muleteer was tired, and the traders continued their journey, taking with them matter for talk about the poor fellow who had been cudgelled. He, when he found himself alone, made another effort to rise but if he was unable and whole and sound, how was he to rise after having been thrashed and well-nigh knocked to pieces? And yet he esteemed himself fortunate, as it seemed to him that this was a regular knight-errant's mishap, and entirely he considered the fault of his horse. However, battered in body as he was, to rise was beyond his power. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 In which the narrative of our knight's mishap is continued Finding, then, that, in fact, he could not move, he thought himself of having recourse to his usual remedy, which was to think of some passage in his books, and his craze brought to his mind that about Baldwin and the Marquis of Mantua, when Carlotto left him wounded on the mountainside, a story known by heart by the children, not forgotten by the young man, and lauded, and even believed by the old folks, and, for all that, not a whit truer than the miracles of Mohammed. This seemed to him to fit exactly the case in which he found himself, so, making a show of severe suffering, he began to roll on the ground, and with feeble breath repeated the very words which the wounded knight of the wood is said to have uttered. Where art thou, lady mine? Art thou? My sorrow does not rue. Thou canst not know it, lady mine, or else thou art untrue. And so he went on with the ballad, as far as the lines... O oh, noble Marquis of Martin Chua, my uncle and liege lord. As chance would have it, when he got to this line, there happened to come a peasant from his own village, a neighbor of his, who had been with a load of wheat to the mill, and seeing the man stretched there, came up to him and asked him who he was, and what was the matter of him that he complained so dolefully. Don Quixote was firmly persuaded that this was the Marquis of Mantua, his uncle, so the only answer he made was to go on with his ballad, in which he told the tale of his misfortune, and the, and of the loves of the emperor's son, and his wife, all exactly as the ballad sings it. 
The peasant stood amazed at hearing such nonsense, and, relieving him of the visor, already battered to pieces by blows, he wiped his face, which was covered with dust, and as soon as he had done so, he recognized him, and said, "'Senor Quijada!' for so he appears to have been called when he was in his senses, and had not changed from a quite country gentleman into a knight-errant. "'Who has brought your worship to this pass?' But to all questions the other only went on with his ballad. Seeing this, the good man removed as well as he could his breastplate and bagpiece, to see if he had any wound, but he could perceive no blood nor any mark anywhere. He then contrived to raise him from the ground, and with no little difficulty hoisted him upon his ass, which seemed to him to be the easiest mount for him, and, collecting the arms, even to the splinters of the lance, he tied them on to Rocinant, and, leading him by the bridle and the ass by the halter, he took the road for the village, very sad to hear what absurd stuff Don Quixote was talking. Nor was Don Quixote less so, for what with blows and bruises he could not sit upright on the ass, and from time to time he sent up sighs to heaven, so that once more he drove the peasant to ask what ailed him. And it could have been only the devil himself that put into his head tales to match his own adventures, for now, forgetting Baldwin, he bethought himself of the Moor Abendares, when the Alcade of Anticura, Rodrigo de Narave, took him prisoner and carried him away to his castle, so that when the peasant asked him again, how he was and what ailed him, he gave him for reply the same words and phrases that the, that the captive Ambindarare gave to Rodrigo de Narave, just as he had read the story in Diana of George de Montemayor, where it is applying it to his own case so aptly that the peasant went along cursing his fate that he had to listen to such a lot of nonsense, from which, however, he came to the conclusion that his neighbor was mad, and so made all haste to reach the village to escape the wearisomeness of this harangue of Don Quixote's, who, at the end of it, said, Senor Don Rodrigo de Narave, your worship must know that this fair Zarifa I have mentioned is now the lovely Dulcinea del Toboso, for whom I have done and doing and will do the most famous deeds of chivalry that in this world have been seen, are to be seen, or ever shall be seen. To this the peasant answered, Senor, sinner that I am, cannot your worship see that I am not Don R Rodrigo de Narave, nor the Marquis of Manchua, but Pedro Alonso, your neighbor, and that your worship is neither Baldwin nor Abendare, but the worthy gentleman, Senor Quijada? I know who I am, replied Don Quixote, and I know that I may be not only those I have named, but all the twelve peers of France, and even all the nine worthy, since my achievements surpass all they have done altogether, and each of them on his own account. With this talk and more of the same kind, they reached the village just as night was beginning to fall, and the peasant waited until it was a little later, that the belaboured gentleman might not be seen riding in such a miserable trim. When it was what seemed to him the proper time, he entered the village and went to Don Quixote's house, which he found all in confusion, and there were the curate and the village barber who were great friends of Don Quixote, and his housekeeper was saying to them in a loud voice, "'What does your worship think can have befallen my master, Senor Licentiate Pero Pere? For, so the curate was called, "'It is three days now since anything has been seen of him.' or hack, or the buckler, lance, or armor. Miserable me, I am certain of it, and it is as true as that I was born to die, that these accursed books of chivalry he has, and has got into the way of reading so constantly, have upset his reason. For now I remember having often heard him say to himself that he would turn knight-errant, and go all over the world in quest of adventures, to the devil and Baraba with such books that have brought to ruin in this way the finest understanding there was in all of La Mancha. The niece said the same and more. "'You must know, Master Nicholas, for that was the name of the barber. "'It was often my uncle's way to stay two days and nights together, "'poring over those unholy books of misadventures, "'for which he would fling the book away and snatch up his sword "'and fall to slashing the walls, and when he was tired out "'he would say he had killed four giants, like four towers, "'and the sweat that flowed from him when he was weary, he said, "'was the blood of the wounds he had received in battle, "'and then he would drink a great jug of cold water.' and become calm and quiet, saying that this water was a most precious potion which the sage Esquife, a great magician and friend of his, had brought him. But I take all the blame upon myself for never having told you of my uncle's vagaries, that you might put a stop to them before things had come to pass, and burn all these accursed books, for he has a great number, that richly deserve to be burned like heretics. So say I, too, said the curate, but— my faith to-morrow shall not pass without public judgment upon them, and may they be condemned to the flames, lest they lead those that read to behave as my good friend seems to have behaved. All this the peasant heard, and from it he understood what was the matter with his neighbor. So he began calling aloud, <laughs> Open your worships to Signor Baldwin and to Signor the Marquis of Mantua, who comes badly wounded, and to Signora Abindare the Moor, 
whom the valiant Rodrigo de Navarre, the alcade of Anticura, brings captive. At these words they hurried out, and when they recognized their friend, master, and uncle, who had not yet dismounted from the ass because he could not, they ran to embrace him. Hold, said he, for I am badly wounded through my horse's fault. Carry me to bed, and if possible send for the wise Organda to cure and see to my wounds. See there, plague on it, said the housekeeper at this. Did not my heart tell the truth as to which foot my master went lame of? To bed with your worship at once, and we will contrive to cure you here without fetching that Hurganda. I a curse, I say, once more, and a hundred times more, on those books of chivalry that have brought your worship to such a pass. They carried him to bed at once, and after searching for his wounds could find none, but he said they were all bruises from having had a severe fall with his horse Rosinet when in combat with ten giants, the biggest and the boldest to be found on the earth. So, so, said the curate, are there, are there giants in the dance? By the sign of the cross I will burn them to-morrow before the day over. They put a host of questions to Don Quixote, but his only answer to all was, Give him something to eat, and leave him to sleep, for that was what he needed most. They did so, and the curate questioned the peasant at great length as to how he found Don Quixote. He told him, and the nonsense he had talked when found, and on the way home, all which made the licentiate the more eager to do what he did the next day, which was to summon his friend the barber, Master Nicholas, and go with him to Don Quixote's house. End of chapter 5 End of part 5